Hi, this is Pastor Al Pino, and you're watching a video of one of our sermons at Palm Vista Community Church. We invite you to find out more about us at palmvista.org. All right, so the text we're going to be looking at this morning is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. So if you would like to turn over there, it'll also be on the screen, but we'll read that together here in just a a few moments. So other than being formerly an inline speed skater, um, some of you know this about me that I hang out with regularly. Most of you probably don't, uh, but I am also a golf addict. Uh, I inherited this love of golf from my father. Um, I am not the greatest golfer by any stretch of the imagination, but I sure do enjoy the game. Uh, one of my favorite times of the year, even from a kid, or as a kid, I one of my first tournaments I watched was the Masters Tournament. I watched it with my dad uh, when, I was, when I was very small. And since my, my son, he, he's uh, two and a half, he enjoys watching golf uh, with me. We're still working on counting uh, numbers on your hands, but if you show him a logo from the Masters Tournament, he'll be able to tell you that the winner gets a green jacket, um, that he is going to win three green jackets, and that he's going to beat Tiger Woods. So he is quite the ambitious uh, little fella. Um, I watch as many tournaments as possible. Uh, I play whenever I get the chance. I even moved to Florida so that I could golf year-round. Just ask my wife. Um, just kidding. Uh, but so, so the Masters Tournament, one of my favorite times of the year. It happens every April, um, typically the first or second weekend of April. It's the first of four major tournaments held each year, but it's the only major tournament that is held on the same course year after year. The name of the course is Augusta National. It's probably the most private country club in America, maybe even the world. There are only about 300 members of Augusta National, and the only people who know the exhaustive membership role of Augusta National are the members themselves. Uh, this is not a course where uh, being a member is entirely based on your wealth or your, your accolades or your fame. Uh, for reference, Bill Gates once sent a blank check to the membership committee of Augusta National with a note that said, whatever it takes, meaning fill in this amount, whatever it takes to become a member. I'm sure he was quite surprised to get that blank check back in the mail with a note that said it takes patience and discretion. Um, so... <laughs> This is certainly a different group of folks that we're working with. The public, uh, you can get tickets to watch the Masters, typically through a wait list, uh, but to play the course, to become a member of the course, is an entirely different story. Uh, to play the course, you must know a living member of the country club. They must chaperone you while you're on the grounds, not even just playing. Like As soon as you cross the gate, they have to be engaged in chaperoning you. All of this also must be approved. You have to know the right people to gain exclusive access to Augusta National. The text that we're going to look at this morning, it points to a, a similar type of exclusive access. This is an access where you have to know the right person in order to be accepted and permitted to enter the very presence of God. And in turn, this access, it fuels how we should live this section comes at a critical point in the letter, and reading the chapters leading up to this particular text that we're going to look at today, it'll really, it's very beneficial towards understanding the main idea of this particular section. So I would encourage you this week to read uh, the, the preceding chapters um, so that you, get, you just see the flow of thought of, of what the author of Hebrews is laying out for us. Today, we're going to jump right in. Uh, the main idea of our text today is for Christians to enter God's presence with confidence, and to persevere as God's people with purpose. We see the basis of which Christians may enter God's presence with confidence. It's the finished work of Jesus. Jesus' blood atoned for sins once for all, and he opened the way into the direct presence of God as our high priest. This is the argument that, uh, that is used to then encourage, it's the foundation used to encourage Christians to persevere as God's people with purpose uh, by drawing near to God, by holding fast the confession of hope, and considering how to stir one another up to love and to good works. So if you would join me in reading uh, from Hebrews 10, 
verses 19 through 25. The author of Hebrews writes, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So these verses uh, function as a, a sort of turning point in the letter. The author has now laid out an argument for us to, point one, enter God's presence with confidence. We see this in verses 19 to 21. The groundwork has been laid for the author to now call the Christian to action. The word, therefore, it gives this away, and it is the clue that the author is starting to, he's bringing his, his argument in for landing. This argument began in chapter 5 as the author uh, started to explain the superiority of Christ over the Mosaic law which included the Old Testament sacrificial system, as well as the Levitical priesthood that exercised those sacrifices. So most of you probably can't see right now, uh, but I do have a shadow behind me from these very warm and bright lights, um, signaling that there is a substance in between the light and the stage. And in a similar way, we end up with the conclusion that all of those things, the Old Testament sacrificial system, the Levitical priesthood, these things were shadows pointing to the substance. And the substance is found in Christ alone, his person and his work. The fact that this letter was likely written to a, a group of Jewish Christians, it makes this protect, particular section more stunning. Uh, they would have been taught that the presence of God was open only for the high priest, uh, and he was only to enter it once a year. And whenever he entered it, he was to take the blood of a sacrifice with him to cover or to atone for the sins of the people. This was an exclusive right uh, to enter the presence of God. It was opened only to the high priest. Uh, this was not an everyday occurrence. It only happened once a year. And this was not an empty-handed approach. He, the high priest always took blood of a sacrifice with him. But the author of Hebrews, uh, he has laid out an argument that is, that is beautiful. There is one who has come. He has opened the way for his people to enter God's presence based on his high priestly work and on his sacrifice, and his name is Jesus. One difference, uh, his sacrifice, unlike the Old Testament sacrifices that happened year after year after year, his sacrifice would not need to happen again nor be replaced by another sacrifice the following year. It was and is, as the author tells us, once and for all. The author says in, in verse 14 of this same chapter, he says, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. So one can only imagine how revolutionary this thought would have been to Jewish Christians who were hearing about this anticipated deliverance realized in the person of Jesus. That therefore, in verse 19, it's pointing back to this argument that started in chapter 5. Uh, it's foundational for the appeal that the author makes in verses 22 to 25 that we read together. The author is essentially concluding his argument from, that started in chapter 5 in verses 19 to 21, and he appeals for Christians to enter God's presence with confidence by two things. He says that we enter God's presence with confidence by the blood of Christ, and that we enter God's presence with confidence because Christ is our high priest over the house of God. So in verses 19 to 20, uh, we see that we are to enter with confidence by the blood of Christ. Remember, a Jewish person would have been well aware of the sacrificial system and the old covenant that that, that was uh, the, the sacrificial system was under. They would have been taught there is no remission of sins without the blood of a sacrifice. And their lives were likely organized around the, the Jewish calendar, and in particular, the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement was the day, uh, that single day of the year, that the high priest entered into, uh, into the tabernacle to atone, make atonement for the sins of the people with the blood of sacrifices. And they were offered every year, reminding constantly of the need for sins to be paid for. Again, 
Remember the shadow. These things were shadows pointing to the substance that would be realized in Christ. The author of Hebrews, he referred to this as the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. So this was new in the sense that it had not happened before. Jesus lived and died one time in history. And it was new in the sense that it was not like the old sacrificial system. It was the inauguration of the new covenant and the closure of the old. This new way, it was also referenced by the author as living. Uh, it was living in the sense that Christ was and is alive and that it brings about eternal life. Unlike the Old Testament sacrifices uh, that were dead once they were drained of their blood, Christ resurrected from the grave, signaling that he was indeed powerful over death. So we enter with confidence by the blood of Christ. Second, we enter with confidence because Christ is our high priest. Look at verse 21. So in chapter 9, uh, we'll get to verse 21. In chapter 9, the author uh, recalls the layout of the tabernacle. There was a difference between where the priest, plural, and the high priest, singular, could and could not go. The priest, plural, regularly went into the first section of the tabernacle, but the high priest, singular, was only permitted, or was permitted, the only one permitted to enter the second section, which is where the presence of the Lord was. And again, he could only enter here once a year and not without the sacrifice of, of blood to atone for sins. The priest regularly stood at their service, daily, in fact. Every year, same offerings uh, made over and over and over, but none perfected the conscience of the worshiper. They just brought back the same old memory of the failure in the pursuit of righteousness. That's stage left. Stage right. Enter Jesus, our great high priest. He entered not the tent made with human hands, as these, as these priests had done. No, he entered into the most perfect tent, the one not made with human hands, into the direct presence of holy, almighty God. And not only did he enter into the holy place, but he provided the ultimate sacrifice by laying, out, laying down his own life for us. This was the sacrifice needed to atone for sin. When he did this, the curtain that separated those two sections of the tabernacle, it was immediately and permanently torn in two from top to bottom, signaling that the presence of God was now open to those who professed faith and belief in the work of Christ. A way had been made. All these shadows, they gave way. The substance was realized in Jesus, and he is now seated and reigning in power until, resting from his work, until the time that he will return. He doesn't need to continue standing like the other priests did daily. His work is finished. And in, in him, we no longer have to stand daily at our service either. We can find rest in the work of Christ. We don't have to try to make amends for our sin because Christ has done it. He has accomplished it. I think there is an appeal here both for the person who would call themselves a Christian and the person who would not call themselves a Christian. For the Christian, the appeal is to find rest in the completed work of Christ. Because his, his work, his sacrifice in our place were sufficient, we don't have to stand daily trying to make ourselves right before God. He has done it. For those who would not call themselves Christian, much like the Old Testament sacrificial system, perhaps you're in this rut of continually offering year after year, maybe day after day, the same sacrifices to try to make yourself right before God. It could be just doing good deeds, or it could be just avoiding bad things. Um, either way, Christian or non-Christian, I think the appeal is very similar. Uh, we all need forgiveness. We all need atonement for the, the bad things or what the Bible would call sins uh, committed. And the resolution to this problem is found solely in Jesus, no one else. So the foundation, the author lays a foundation uh, for the Christians uh, to enter God's presence with confidence and, in turn, to persevere as God's people with purpose. Point two, to persevere as God's people with purpose. Christians are not to take these truths and just sit by idly waiting on the return of Christ. No, these truths are too glorious for the Christian to just sit there and bottle it up. New avenues have been opened to those who profess faith in, in Jesus, namely the ability to enter the very presence of God himself. 
Christians are told that because we now have access to the presence of God through the blood of Jesus as our high priest, we are to persevere by a few things. The author tells us uh, that we are to, to persevere in the Christian faith with purpose, by drawing near to God, by holding fast the confession of hope, and by considering how to stir one another up to love and to good works. So first, the author tells us in verse 22 that we are to draw near to God because the Christian now has full access to the presence of God. There's no curtain separating the, the first part of the tent from the second. Jesus has removed that. There are multiple qualifiers that the author gives us here. First, he says that we are to draw near with a true heart. Some translate this as drawing near with a sincere heart. Easy way to understand it, it's, a, it's commitment that is genuine, that is free from superficiality, it's commitment that is free from hypocrisy, and it's commitment that is free from any type of ulterior motive, coming to God in order just to get something from him. Second, those who draw near to God are to do so in full assurance of faith. Faith is not about what the person professing belief brings to the table. It's not about what I bring to the table or what you bring to the table, but what Christ brings to the table. Christian faith is not held in the hope of our power, but rather it's held in the hope of Christ's power. In other words, drawing near to God and full assurance of faith is simply believing that Jesus was who he said he was and that he accomplished what he said he would accomplish. This really kind of fuel, fuels the third and the fourth qualifiers that the author gives us. Third, he says that we are encouraged to draw near Draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Believing Jesus was who he said he was is really played out right here. We must believe that Jesus' sacrifice was enough to cover our sins. When we draw near, his blood, as the once for all sacrifice, cleanses us permanently. We no longer have to carry around this burden that we can barely bear, or can't bear, um, of an evil conscience, of, of our sins. Whenever our consciences rise to condemn us, the blood of Jesus truly speaks a better word uh, over those things because he atoned for our sins. The blood of Jesus does what the blood of bulls and goats from the Old Testament could not. It cleanses our hearts from sin and it perfects us. The last qualifier is that our bodies be washed with pure water. Uh, some debate what exactly this is referring to, uh, but what is clear that it is not referring to is some external cleansing uh, that carries some type of salvific effect. Uh, in other words, you're taking a bath to be saved. Um, no, that's not what this is referring to. This type of position would not be coherent with the rest of the argument that the author of Hebrews makes. Uh, rather, this is uh, it's likely referring to Christian baptism, which is an, an external act pointing to the internal change that has been produced by God, not by the person professing belief, but uh, internal change produced by God uh, for the person who believes. Second, we are to hold fast the confession of hope. We see this in verse 23. The confession of hope referenced is the person and work of Jesus. Uh, while this does not need a long explanation, the encouragement to hold fast, catch these words that the author says. He says to hold fast the confession without wavering. That would have been a challenge to lay before the, this particular group of Christians who was reading this text, who was hearing this first person. Having already gone through various forms of persecution with more lurking right around the corner, uh, the exhortation to not waver on one's confession, on one's hope in Jesus, would have carried a fair amount of weight with it. Uh, thankfully, we are reminded in this text uh, to rely on God, for he who promised is faithful, is what the author tells us. What a sweet reminder that God is faithful to his promises. We hold on not because of our tenacity, and not because you have a strong grip, and not because you're very strong. We hold on solely because of God's power. Praise God that he keeps his children, and that he will continue to do so. We can rely on his power with confidence and without wavering. 
Third, the author tells us to consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works. Look at verses 24 to 25 in the text. Christians are called to put forth effort and thought as to how we are to stir one another up, how we might spur one another on to love and and good works. In other words, to image our Savior, Jesus. Christians are to possess a genuine care and concern for one another. The author continues this thought in verse 25 by showing how this cannot be done. He says that Christians must not neglect meeting together. Apparently, some had grown cold in their love for one another and perhaps just began neglecting meeting together. They, they stopped you know, being in fellowship with other saints uh, that were right around them. The neglect of meeting with other Christians, it, it really shows both a lack of concern for fellow Christians and it's likely pointing to pride in the heart. One who thinks they can carry on alone without uh, being in fellowship with other believers, uh, has likely lost concern for obeying the commands of Jesus. That's a, that's a heavy statement to consider. Fellowship with other Christians is the very means that Christ uses to protect and to shepherd his flock, to care for us. It's done by being in fellowship with one another. The church is a place uh, where we come and we hold one another in close. We hold one another within arm's distance. Uh, We're not stiff-arming everyone, trying to keep them back. Rather, we come together and everything is right in here. No personal bubbles within the church. Um, Culture, sure. Church, no. Thankfully, we are not left there. We are shown what the church should do by showing what they should not do do. The thought started in verse 24. It comes back into focus. Christians are encouraged to thoughtfully consider, how do we stir one another up to love and to good works? How can I push my brother or my sister uh, on, onward in the faith? How can, we, how can we help each other? How can, whenever there's something on their heart and they, they say it, how can I come alongside you? How can I be thoughtful and consider, how can I come alongside you and encourage you to press on in that task for the glorification of God's name? And Christians are to do this with a sense of urgency. Uh, we're not just supposed to just you know, sit back and, and chill, uh, waiting on the return of Christ. The return of Christ is imminent right now. He could come back at any moment. He could come back before the service ends. So in light of that, we are to, to do this with intention, being intentional, intentionality, to do it with urgency, uh, because he will come back. We're to meet together for the purpose of of pushing each other, spurring one another on towards faithfulness, towards love, towards good works, but we do this together. Summed up what the author is saying here in this text, Christians are encouraged to persevere as God's people with purpose. So, actually bringing this in for landing now, uh, there are actually, there are several concluding thoughts Um, that that do come to mind, but I want to give you four in particular. First, the argument of Christ as superior and worthy of our lives is nothing short of stunning. Think of how how revolutionary uh, this reading this letter would have been for a Jewish Christian immersed in Judaism, growing up under the, under the Old Covenant, seeing the, the Old Testament sacrifices offered year after year, knowing that you can only go through the high priest, but anticipating deliverance the entire time. But then you finally see this deliverance realized in the person and work of Jesus. That, that had to be mind-blowing for them to see this. It should be mind-blowing for us today. Jesus is worthy of our worship. Second, the substance that the shadows were were pointing to, uh, it has been revealed. And he, Jesus, accomplished what he said he would. He offers forgiveness. Uh, He offers eternal life in the presence of God. He offers just access to the presence of God. Because of his sacrifice, the curtain has been torn. The exclusive presence of God opened for those who profess faith in, in, in him as Savior. Jesus provides an access uh, that we can't earn on our own. Uh, Think about Augusta National. My my sister used to live 
in Augusta. And when I, the first time I visited her, I was like, I want to see Augusta National. I was really expecting to see it. Uh, whenever we drove by, it's in a not so great neighborhood of Augusta. Um, and there are giant fences lining the entire course um, with green tarp on the inside. So you can't even see anything. Um, this type of access, you're not standing outside just trying to find a hole in the tarp to peek through. Uh, you're not in there on some temporary pass uh, that you got through some wait list. No, the direct presence of God is opened through Christ. This is an exclusive access opened only through Christ, uh, and it is permanent. Praise God for that. Third, God continues to act and to keep his children because he is faithful. The fact that we are not the ones to muster the energy uh, to stay faithful— that God is the one who provides this, this thought should humble us. Our hope is not based on how faithful we are, but what does the author tell us? It is based on how faithful he is. Last, in God's providence, part of his keeping us uh, is really done by being in fellowship with one another, considering how to spur one another onward in the faith. Not only are Christians encouraged to meet together and consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, Uh, The fact is that we actually need each other. Uh, Several of you know I I had the opportunity to live in Southeast Asia for a couple of years. Um, And I lived in Thailand. I had a teammate. His name was Elijah. Um, But our job was actually in Laos. Um, Being in Thailand, they actually drive on the opposite side of the road as we do. And their cars are set up the opposite of ours. Um, So I learned how to drive a stick shift vehicle for the first time, um, driving on the opposite side of the road, sitting on the opposite side of the car. Well, I'm over here. It should be like this. Uh, Sitting on the opposite side of the car, um, trying to shift with my left hand, all while suffering from somewhat severe jet lag. Um, Not real sure who thought that was a good idea, uh, but thankfully no one was injured so that I could tell this story today. Um, (laughs) Although the guy who taught me, I don't think, actually, I can think of one other person. Uh, So the first time I was driving, I was trying to pay attention to how do I shift, and uh, I almost ended up in the median, and so he was like yelling at me to not go into the median. Uh, The second person who uh, was pretty comical to see in that, in this scenario, was my wife, Elizabeth, when she came to to visit me in Thailand once. I don't think uh, I've ever seen someone almost go into the back seat from the front seat (laughs) quite so quickly. Um, so, so part of our job, part of my job was in Laos, um, but it required accessing pretty, pretty rough terrain on, on some of our trips. And so we, my teammate and I, we had a, a four wheel drive SUV that we would drive over on occasion. Um, you know, at first I thought, Hey, this is no big deal. I'm used to driving this. Um, we're good. I was very nervous at first because I, I don't know, I didn't want to break down in the middle of Laos on top of some hilltop and no one could get me. Um, but eventually, you know, we, we plan our first trip. We're getting ready to drive across. All is good. Um, so whenever you go through immigration at the, our particular crossing where we lived, uh, the bridge does this number right here. So I'm driving on the opposite side of the road. And as soon as I get cleared and drive over, the bridge does this because in Laos, they drive on the same side of the road as we do. Um, so not a big deal until we cross over this bridge and we both realize this is going to be problematic. Um, Not only am I sitting on the opposite side of the car trying to drive, but there are no fences for cattle. Um, There are no driving regulations whatsoever. There's nothing like a stoplight. Everyone just does whatever they want to do. Um, I'm sure there are, I'm sure you've been to other countries that are very much like that. I'm sure a mailman in Hialeah gets the same thrill every day. Um, (laughs) He would have to. Uh, so it was, it was an adjustment every time that we crossed over. Uh, we both had to be awake and active. There were no napping on these trips because I had a severe blind spot. Whoever was driving, if we wanted to pass, um, we had to like inch the car over a little bit. And the other guy's like almost hanging his head out the window to make sure there's no oncoming traffic, making sure there's no cattle crossing, making sure there's not cattle just laying in the road. Um, any other circumstance that would prevent safe passage. We had, to, we had to ask them, hey man, am I clear? Elijah, am I good to pass? Uh, why? Because I had a severe blind spot. 
active participation was necessary from both of us. If I was driving, Elijah couldn't nap. If Elijah was driving, I couldn't nap. We had to stay awake and help one another. Our, our lives are very much the same way. Uh, all of us likely have blind spots that we are either fully aware of or partially aware of. And if you tell me you don't have a blind spot, uh, if I was a bet man, I would say that this is your blind spot. <laughs> we need other brothers and sisters in the faith to come alongside us, to spur us on, to encourage us. We need help with these blind spots, and we need people that we can trust with those blind spots. What better place to do that than in Christian fellowship in the church? This life is tough. We need each other to persevere, to press on, to make safe passage all the way through. It's what, how Paul would describe it to Timothy as keeping the faith. One way, there are a lot, a lot of ways that this can happen. One way that we do it here is through community groups. Um, Al and Corey are going to be outside after the service. There, if you don't know about our community groups, there is a table with information only on community groups, and they would be happy to answer any question uh, that you have. But maybe you're, you're not in a position to make it to those. Maybe just whatever season of life you find yourself in, it's very hard for you to make it to those. Um, if that's the case and that's you, I would encourage you to find someone or some ones that have a, a schedule similar to yours um, that you can meet with uh, regularly and, and come alongside one another, people that you can trust with your blind spots that can push you onward in the faith. And I'm not, I won't define regularly for you other than consistently. Um, it could be once a week. It could be uh, once every two weeks. It could be once a month. I meet with a few guys once a month, uh, and we just come together. We figure out what's going on in one another's lives. We pray for each other, um, and it's really a sweet time. These guys, um, are not shy to speak into my blind spots, um, and I'm grateful for them, truly. So we are included in God's family as his children. Uh, this is a gift of grace that God uses to protect and to care for his children. It's a gra it is grace to have fellowship with other saints uh, that would come alongside us, that would challenge us, that would that would weep with us whenever we need to weep, that would rejoice with us when we need to rejoice, that would come alongside us when we get tired and just push us on, give us that next little nudge to keep going, to keep pressing on. And this is good news in every way for the person who professes belief in Jesus, no matter what this life entails, and it's open to everyone. Well, let's pray. Uh, worship team, if you could. Return back to the stage. Father, you are a good God. You are a kind and loving Father that you would provide the, the ultimate sacrifice needed uh, to atone for our sin that you would provide your son who would step in as our high priest to enter your presence. We thank you for the confidence that we have in you, Lord Jesus, that our sins have been paid for, that they are completely atoned for, that I don't have to stand daily at service to make myself right before you, and no one in this room would have to by, by believing in you. We thank you, Father, for the grace just of being in fellowship with other believers. Folks, you can come alongside us and, and spur us onward. They can challenge us. They are there to just love on us, be a, a shoulder to, to weep on. But that encouraged by saying, look upward. There is a vision that is much greater than any hurt turmoil that you find yourself in, any joy that you could experience right now, there is a greater joy that will be had in the presence of God for eternity. So God, even as we just, as we sing the, the song that you would be our vision, would you remind us that there is something much greater than anything, any trouble that we will endure on a daily basis. 
Thank you for loving us. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood, giving up your life on the cross. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you act to keep us. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this message. If you want to find out more about us, you can visit our website at palmvista.org.